This is a graph that potentially shows a relationship between police militarization and police violence. And what I want to do in this video is to explore this graph. I'm going to explain to you the research I did to produce this. This is something that I looked to, into on my own. And so I'm going to tell you about the hypothesis I was testing and how I collected the data. So that way you can understand what this graph means. And if we need to go forward doing something to demilitarize the police. A Salt Lake City police officer in full riot gear using his shield to push an elderly man with a cane. The man falls face first onto the ground. Those two officers are seen pushing a 75-year-old man. Uh, they were suspended and now the 57 resignations. Sky Force 10 shows police firing the gas into a crowd of demonstrators as they rushed for the fences. Like many of you, I was shocked in June as I watched protests for Black Lives Matters clash with police. And it was just this strange thing for me to see these protests that were against police violence to be met with some extreme police violence. And the thing that just really got me was looking at some of these behaviors and thinking, how is it that we got to a point where we treat other humans this way? As I was trying to grapple with what was going on in the world, I came across a book recommendation on Twitter for Radley Balco's Rise of the Warrior Cop. This is a story of the rise of police militarization, how these police came to look like stormtroopers, how the culture and incentives formed a different police than what we were used to in other decades. Now, the author attributes this to lots of different things that have happened over the past few decades and focuses on a few. But if we were to think about this in economics, basically he's claiming there are at least three things that lead to police violence. One, the cost of misbehavior has decreased significantly. Two, today it is incredibly cheap to equip police forces with military level gear. And three, there's been a change in the labor force where we're recruiting a different type of police officer than we used to. These three things come together and he basically says in the language of economics, when you lower the cost of police violence, you are going to increase the amount of police violence that you get. And I wanted to test this. I wanted to see if there was any grounding behind this. And so there's a testable hypothesis here. The more you militarize the police, the more police violence you will get. Now the question is, can we find data to actually test this hypothesis? And this seems like a pretty straightforward analysis, but there's actually some lot of complications behind it on all sides of this. It starts with the data and then goes with the inference that we can make from the data. So let me start with the data and let me start with what we would think is the easiest one to get and that's measuring police violence. But how do we measure police violence? We could measure it in some sort of like level of conflict, but that that's a little bit hard, especially when there are 18,000 different police departments around the United States. Maybe we can measure it in property damage. I got it. Open the door! One of the things that Balco goes over in his book is how no-knock warrants have led to this police culture where they're barging into homes and they're just breaking down doors and ruining property. And I'm not saying this is the case for all police officers. Please do not take what I say and make more out of it. But what I'm saying is that maybe we can measure that property damage as some form of police violence. Maybe if we had the data, we could do that, but that's gonna be really tough. I think the best thing we can do to look at police violence is to look at officer-involved killings. That seems like a clear outcome that we can count. Somebody died, it was from a bullet from an officer. We don't need to worry about whether it was justified or not, right? Like. That's something that we would want to consider, but even just understanding how many people have been killed by a police officer, that should be a number that we can easily produce, right? <laughs> Turns out, even though we track plenty of crime data, we don't track officer-involved killings that well. In fact, this has become a project by people like the Washington Post, who are trying to track down how many people have been killed by officers just since 2015. So this is actually the data that I'm going to use. It is the Washington Post fatal force data, which has tried to track every officer involved killing since January 1st, 2015. Remember the hypothesis is that more militarization leads to more violence. And so now we have a measure of violence. That's going to be officer involved killings. How do we measure militarization? This is even harder. This is this could potentially be subjective. Like how do you get at culture or how do you get an incentives and say, this is a police department that is more militarized 
than this police department. Well, as I read Rise of the Warrior Cop, I came across something that could provide us a measure of militarization. It comes from the 1033 program. The 1033 program has been around since the late 90s, and it is a Pentagon program that transfers military equipment to police departments. Rather than go through like the detail, this is exactly what you'll see at police departments because of this program. Let me just give you what I think is the most extreme example. The Los Angeles School Police Department, the police department in charge of schools in Los Angeles participates in this program. And they, through this program, received 61 rifles, three grenade launchers, and this mine resistant vehicle. When I see this, it reminds me of that scene from the Santa Claus where they try to pitch a toy of Santa in a tank and Tim Allen is going like, Well kids, I, I certainly hope you've been good this year because it looks like Santa just took out the Pearson home. It's coming! To me, this seems like a very straightforward measure of militarization. If you get more equipment from this program, your department is more militarized. By no means is this a perfect measure and there are plenty of reasons to say this is not the right way to measure this. And I hear you, don't worry, this is all just a first look at the data. But let me give you the benefit of this. We have a dollar amount that we can say this is how much the department has militarized. That means if you have received a certain dollar amount, you are militarized in this much and if the value of your equipment is twice as large you are twice as much militarized as this other department this is a nice economic measurable way of looking at militarization and by no means is it the final word if we want to test this hypothesis that police militarization leads to police violence how will it look when we put this data together imagine that on the x-axis you have militarization that means the further you go right the more militarized you are and on the y-axis you have police violence. The higher you go, the more violence you expect to see. And now let's put a scatter plot of states and how many killings there have been in these states and militarization, how much military gear these states have received. What do we expect the scatter plot to look like? Well, if this hypothesis is true, then when there's less militarization, we should see less violence. That means we're gonna have this bottom left-hand corner have some dots. Conversely, when there's more militarization, we should see more police violence, which means we should see dots up in this top right-hand corner. So this is the pattern we're looking for to see if our hypothesis is true. Now, let me give a very clear disclaimer. I am not trying to go for causality here. I am not trying to say, does police militarization cause police violence? What I'm looking at is, is there evidence in the data that's consistent with the causal hypothesis. And I'm going to explain why we can't go for causality after I show you this data. This brings us back to the graph I showed you at the very beginning. Along the x-axis is the total value of military equipment these states have received since 1990s adjusted for population. And along the y-axis, we have the number of police killings in those states also adjusted for population. And the dots on this graph match exactly the prediction we made if the hypothesis was true. So this relationship, this correlation is actually very strong. It is what we call statistically significant. It does not appear to be happening at random. In fact, if you run a regression line through this, you'll see that a 10% increase in the value of military equipment per capita is associated with a 4% increase in the killings per capita. Now, let me just reiterate, I am not claiming causality here. I cannot claim causality and I can tell you why. First, this is a very first blush look at the data. This is at the state level. We've just taken 50 states and we've totaled up everything that's happened inside that state. The least we would want to do is try to get this data down to the police department level or maybe the county level where we can say this area specifically received this much military equipment. Do we also see an increase in killings? We wanna see if the killings are happening exactly where those departments received military equipment. The second reason we can't claim causality is because there could be a reverse causality story. What if it's the case that the places where there's more conflict and more violence and more threats against police, that's where they're requesting this program. They're requesting equipment to deal with the greater threat. So that would be not the military equipment causing the killings, it would be the killings causing the military equipment. For now, this is just a correlation, but it is a strong enough correlation that has me thinking, 
what is going on here? Is it really the case that militarization is leading to police violence? The hypothesis seems solid. The data are already supporting it. What we need to do is find a causal analysis that goes deeper and deals with the hidden variables. If you want to understand what I mean by hidden variables, go ahead and check out this video on causality and education. So that way you can understand the troubles that we try to deal with as economists when we look at causal effects. And if you're new to this channel, please join this community interested in and excited about economics. We'll see you next time on Market Power.